Yeah, thanks everyone for coming. As Josh said, we're going to be talking about building an API with GraphQL 4. So, who am I? Um, probably everyone, most of you know. I'm Adam, one of the development leads at Previous Next. Um, you'll see me on Slack and um, on Drupal.org as AC Bramley. Um, today we're going to cover how to kickstart your GraphQL API, um, how to write, write your own data producers, how to write secure mutations to update, create, and delete content on your site. And as we go through this stuff, um, there's going to be live demos of how we integrated all this stuff into our React apps. Um, and just a little side note, I was born and raised in Wellington, so it's pretty amazing to, to be speaking here and be back and, and seeing all you lovely people. So first up, what actually is GraphQL? Um, this quote is from graphql.org. GraphQL is a query language for APIs and a runtime for fulfilling those queries with your existing data. So QL is query language, and graph is actually just referring to the way we're modeling our data. So it easily maps to real world data and mental models about how our business domain is defined. So we define it as schema, which similar to like object oriented programming can kind of just be thought of as a collection of types or classes and those reference other types and then those reference other types and so on and so forth. Um, so our schema sort of defines the interface, and then we have a free, the freedom to implement the back end however we like. So an example of a, a schema for something that we're actually going to talk about later. We've got a resource, it's got a bunch of fields. Some of those fields are referencing other types, which have their own fields, so on and so forth. And uh, what's really nice about GraphQL is you can get all of this information uh, in a single query um, really nicely uh, structured. Um, so here's an example of give me a resource with this UUID, give me all this information, and then you get this really nice JSON uh, response back. And you can really easily traverse everything. Um, and we'll go through more of this stuff in a little bit. But, oh, so, yep. Um, so for this uh, presentation, um, I'm gonna talk about what our main use case for GraphQL was. Um, I say main in parenthesis because we, this is the first thing we use it for. We ended up using it for basically everything else on the website because we loved it so much. Um, if anyone saw my talk last year at um, Drupal South Brisbane um, on open search, this stuff is based on the same project as that was. So you might see some familiar design elements and so forth. Um, so what was the actual feature? Well, the client wanted us to um, add an, a save um, option to content on the website. So being able to save resources to what we call a collection. In this case, resources were just different content types. One is literally called resource, but there was a bunch of other ones. So we needed to be able to save a resource um, with, that, with this, this heart icon on a, on a page. The icon needs to show the status, whether the page is uh, saved or not. Um, and then when you save or unsave something, it needs to update on the fly. Uh, you needed to be able to save a resource to one or more collections through a modal UI like this. You need to be able to create new collections as you're saving con um, content to collections. And of course, you need to be able to see your saved resources and manage those resources and collections as well. In this scenario, collections are specific to a user. So the user owns the collection, they're the only one that can uh, view it and manage it and so forth. Uh, except there was also a feature that needed to be able to share a collection. So a user should be able to toggle on link sharing and then they can share that collection with the public. Um, in Drupal this was just pretty simple access control stuff, but um, we'll talk about how we actually built all of that um, to begin with. Uh, you might be wondering, why don't we just use JSON API? And we actually did. Uh, the first sort of proof of concept for this feature was using JSON API. Um, it just didn't turn out that great, and we had to do a lot of manual stuff to um, get it working. We thought, screw it, why not try GraphQL? Um, it was a new sort of um, bleeding edge project anyway. Let's give GraphQL a go. Um, so as an example of one reason we didn't really like JSON API was if if you've worked with JSON API, you'll be well familiar with something, uh, the payloads that it sends back. 
can be pretty hard to manage in your front end. Um, there's a lot of data normalization that you've usually got to do, um, especially when it comes to things like query caching, making React, React, um, your React apps nice and snappy. Um, JSON API was just very uh, difficult to work with, whereas GraphQL, exactly the same data, very much, uh, very easy to read and understand what's going on for both your developers and your uh, software. We also found that um, creating and updating operations were quite a lot more cumbersome with JSON API. We needed to write a lot of access controls around, um, you know, making sure people can't create collections for other users, um, so on and so forth. Again, lots of manual data manipulation in the front end to make things more manageable. Um, and it became really hard to keep track and keep data in sync um, with cache, uh, like query caches and um, things like that with the responses coming back from JSON API. And I'll cover that a little bit more again um, in a bit. So TLDR, JSON API is a really powerful tool out of the box, but it's sort of this broad, largely undefined API that you just gotta figure out how to use. Whereas GraphQL requires much more upfront development time for your, especially for your backend developers, but it just pays off in dividends um, later down the track. So into the GraphQL uh, module on Drupal.org, we're using the GraphQL 4 module as I um, put in my slides. Uh, the difference between GraphQL 4 and 3 is uh, GraphQL 3 version 3 shipped with a lot of things out of the box. It defined um, schema and, and all that sort of thing for you. Whereas GraphQL 4 is more of a really a, a toolkit to empower your developers to design their API um, really from the ground up. A lot of that automation schema, uh, stuff like that has been moved to the GraphQL Compose module, I believe. I haven't used that though, um, so check that out if you need to. Cool, so let's actually get started um, into some GraphQL stuff. So you'll spend most of your time uh, working in the back end anyway, working with your schemas and schema extensions. Um, this uh, Git book, by the way, um, forgot to mention it in the last slide, is an awesome um, piece of documentation that covers all these concepts and a lot more. Um, and yeah, I highly recommend you'd, you'd use that for, uh, for further information. As I said though, um, we're gonna start with schema and schema extensions. So your schema is actually just a PHP plugin um, in your code. Literally just looks like that. You don't actually have to implement anything. This is just what you're tying all of your schema extensions to and what you're configuring um, in your GraphQL server, what it's what's called in the Drupal UI. So when you're creating a GraphQL server, you define what schema it's um, tied to, and then you enable all of these schema extensions. And we're going to talk very, very in depth about these schema extensions because they're probably the hardest thing to wrap your head around um, when you're building one of these APIs with this module. So, First up, we need uh, some GraphQL schema. So we, this is for, again, saving those resources to a collection. So this is our exa an example of our collection schema. So um, if we look at the collection type, we've got a bunch of pretty regular fields. Then we've got things like the owner, which is referencing another type, which is an author. That's another uh, GraphQL type that has its own attributes, so on and so forth. The, um, the most interesting one is this items field, which is uh, another type that we've defined at the top, which is actually what GraphQL considers a union type. And that's just a union of a bunch of other types we've already defined in our code base as well. Then we've got this collection list, which is uh, gonna be the type of data we get back from when we're uh, querying for a list of collections. And yeah, we're gonna demo all that in a sec. So sort of connecting the dots a little bit, you've got this uh, collection extension .base.graphql file that goes in your GraphQL folder in your custom module. Then you've got all your schema extension plugins underneath um, a plugin directory. Inside those schema extensions is uh, where all your code lives that is tying your GraphQL schema to how that field is then resolved in Drupal. Uh, and hope you're ready, because uh, we're really gonna get into it now. So a schema extension um, is really, as I said, how you're defining how GraphQL is resolving the fields on each of your types. We opted to go with a extension per type, um, although there are like common, um, some common types like the author or the term where you've just got, you know, a simple name and ID 
um, and we stick that in sort of a common extension um, plugin. Um, all of our extensions extend a schema base um, class, which I'll go over again in a minute. Um, but basically, when you implement one of these schema extensions, you're, uh, you're implementing this function called register resolvers, and that's where all your logic lives about how Drupal needs to resolve each of your fields for your type, for your given type. So let's have a look at what one of those might look like. So this is probably <coughs> one of the easier, well, it is probably the easiest um, example that I could find in our code base, and even this is pretty hard to wrap your head around when you see it for the first time. So I'm going to try my best to explain all this to you. Um, but obviously, if you have any more questions after this, feel free to, to come up to me and, and pick my brain. But basically, for every field on every single one of your schema types, you need to call this registry add field resolvers. The registry object is passed into your schema extension, and this add field resolver function is basically saying, hey, GraphQL, this is how you, uh, for the collection type, for the field, for the ID field, this is how you resolve the value of that field. So this add field resolver function takes three arguments, the type, the, the field, and then this uh, resolver, which is really the meat and potatoes and how the field is actually mapped. So let's dive into that particular thing even further. So this is uh, where the naming for things gets pretty confusing. The builder object is um, just something you construct in um, your register resolvers function. Um, it's just, it just comes from the GraphQL module. But what we're saying here is we're saying for the builder, produce me a entity UUID data producer proxy. So the produce function is a factory method for returning a data producer. Data producers are explained um, in much more detail in the handbook, but data producers are basically input output functions that say, you've got this um, entity in this case, give me the result. So produce is giving us a factory um, of a, uh, sorry, it's a factory function for a data producer proxy. We're asking for the entity UID data producer, and then we need to tell uh, GraphQL how to, or the GraphQL module, how to map each parameter on that um, data producer. So in this case, the data producer has one uh, parameter for its resolve function, which is entity, and we're saying map that to this builder from parent, which is basically a magic method of saying, give me the parent entity, or when we're in the context of um, composition, it gives you the result from the previous data producer, which we'll also cover soon. So breaking that down even further to really <laughs> try and understand this, because this is honestly probably one of the hardest things to wrap your head around when you're building an API with GraphQL. Um, we're getting the parent value, we're getting this data producer proxy object, and we're saying, hey, this is how you map the entity parameter in that data producer, and then we're adding that um, for our collection type for the ID field. So this is what the entity UUID data producer looks like. This comes with the GraphQL module and with a whole lot more. Um, as you see, we've got an entity parameter, that's what we're mapping, all it's doing is outputting a UUID. So that's one example of how to map a field. Another example for the name, very similar, we've got an entity label data producer, and we're mapping that to the name field for the collection type. So hopefully I explained that in enough detail that it's starting to make sense. Um, and this is what you can kind of do with that data, right? You can get the name and the ID for a given collection. Um, quickly covering the schema extension base, it's a, we basically implemented like a base class which all of our schemas extend from. Highly recommend doing this for really simple fields like ID, title, author, created, updated date. It's just really going to reduce the uh, duplication through all of your schema extensions um, and make things a little bit more manageable. Okay, let's get a little bit more complex. So. Uh, there's also an idea of data producer composition. So you can compose multiple data producers together to refine your data even further. Uh, so this means you can write really generic data producers that do really specific things, like their entity UUID, and then you chain them together for really powerful field manipulation. So we take a look at an example here. 
uh, we want, in this case, we're mapping a field that we want the absolute URL of an entity for. So we're saying we're using the builder compose function up the top, and that just takes an arbitrary list of arguments. Each one of those arguments is, of course, a data producer. So we're using the, the builder produce function again. In this case, we're using the entity URL data producer, which again is shipped with GraphQL. And we're saying for the entity URL uh, data producer, map the entity property for the builder from parent again, which is going to give us our collection entity, and then map the options parameter to a hard-coded value, which is just setting the URL to absolute. Um, you need to use this builder from value function here to actually pass a hard-coded value. You can't just pass the array. Um, that's just telling uh, GraphQL how to resolve that, that field again, that parameter. And then we're composing that with the URL path uh, data producer because we obviously can't return a URL object in our GraphQL response. We want a string. So we're composing that with URL path and saying map the URL property for URL path to the parent, which is going to be the result of the previous data producer. So you can kind of think of this as like a migrate process plugin uh, pipeline, where you've got a bunch of plugins that do very specific things, and you chain them together to get uh, what you need. Um, the URL path one does other things like cacheable metadata bubbling and, and all that nice stuff for us. Um, so yeah, super, super handy, this, uh, this idea of composition as well. Cool, so we've dis discussed your schema, how to resolve your fields. Now we're going to get into actually how to create, read, update, and delete your data. Um, going back to that, that first, very first example we talked about with saving resources to collections. So let's start with read. Um, always the easiest one, right? <laughs> um, so first we have to define our schema again. In this case, we're defining two different query types. We're saying for a single collection, we can query that by an ID. And for mult getting multiple collections, uh, we need to, uh, in this case, get a list of collections for a given user, which is the owner parameter. And then we've got some pagination options there as well. So then, again, we've got to wire that up with a field resolver. Um, in this case, the type is query. And the, I the field that we're, we're resolving is, in this case, the collection uh, query, which is what we defined in our schema before. And then we're using these awesome magic data producers to say, in this case, we're using entity load by UUID, which is again shipped with the GraphQL module. And we're saying map the type parameter, which is the entity type ID, to this hard coded value. And then we're using, uh, we're mapping the UUID parameter to this builder from argument. So that's going to take the ID argument from our query, pass it into the entity load by UUID data producer, and return our collection object in our case, that's going to then resolve to the collection type and then as we're um, going to see in a moment, we can then query all the fields on that. Um, just by all that schema we've defined before. A little bit more complex with the listing collections by owner. So our, this is a custom data producer that we had to write because obviously GraphQL doesn't know we need to be able to load collections by a user. So we had to write this ourselves. But this is where you can get and start to see the power of all these data producers and, and how everything's resolved together. We could just say map the owner argument to the owner parameter in our data producer and then load our user object in our custom data producer. But we're actually going to take it a step further and say, why don't you just load that object for me and give me the loaded um, user object? which is what this kind of middle chunk here is doing. It's saying, again, use the entity load by UUID for, uh, data producer, take the owner argument from the query, and I'm going to get an actual loaded user object um, in my data producer, and then just map the other two. They don't really matter that much. So this is our actual data producer. Um, this is, so when you're, using, when you're writing a data producer, you know, you've got the class and the plugin definition, but you only actually have to implement one function, which is resolve. And as you can see, right at the top, we've got the owner as an object rather than a UUID, so we don't have to load it manually. Um, and then we do all of our querying, we add our cache data, metadata, and then we return this query connection object, which is um, 
again provided by the GraphQL module and all that does is does some fancy deferred loading and things that I'm not going to pretend to understand, but um, it works very well. All right, so we got all that out of the way and we're going to do a little bit of a live demo. So we're going to pray, pray to the demo gods. We're going to do this. All right, this is going to be very tricky. I didn't think about this, but... Okay, so this is an example. Uh, when you install the GraphQL module and you set up your server, you get this Explorer tab and that gives you a GraphQL, a Graph IQL interface where you can, you know, debug um, your queries, your mutations and everything like that. So this is running uh, that collection query. I'm saying give me the ID and the name for this, collect, uh, for this UUID. If I go over here, I can see I've got the owner and I can ask for the name of the owner as well. And then that's going to give me back the loaded user object. Okay, I'm going to have to really, really speed up because this is going to... And... Okay, we'll just, we'll just leave it there. Whoops. Cool. Oh god, this is a terrible idea. Okay, <laughs> shit. I'm just going to do this, and then we're going to wing it. All right, so creating. Um, this is using something called mutations in GraphQL. Um, it's really just a fancy term. Um, it's nothing um, too special. It's all set up basically the same. So we start with our schema, we've got input and output now, um, and then we define this mutation type, we're calling it create collection in this case, and then mapping the, the input and output. Then again we need a data producer, so in this case we're going to get a, a name and a description, we're going to do some validation, and we're going to save the entity, and then return that saved entity. Then we need to wire it all up. So again, we're using this field resolver. The type in this case now is mutation. The ID is what we define in our schema. And then we're going to use our custom data producer and map um, the, the values using this kind of fancy little anonymous function. All that does is takes an array of data and returns the value for a given key. So, what about that validation that I kind of skipped over? Well, again, there's uh, a page on that in the Git book. However, we do it a little bit differently. So the first, uh, th yeah, there's a few ways to do it. So the first way is sort of following the, um, the conventions in the Git book, where you sort of set up this uh, collection response object, and then you can do, you know, access control, um, stuff like that, and add this violation using this add violation um, method. Um, so our collection response is just a class that extends uh, an, a response class in the GraphQL module. Next, you could just literally return an array of errors. That kind of works as well. Uh, what we actually like to do, though, is um, throw exception. Um, so the user error exception is, um, again, shipped with the GraphQL module, and it's considered client safe, so the error messages in these exceptions are going to make their way to the front end and then you can actually expose those messages to your users. So you've got nice meaningful errors when things, um, when your validation fails. The main reason why I really like this approach is because your front end components actually know there's been a problem in your mutation. So we use the TanStat query library, um, which is, yeah, unreal, it's amazing. We use, it ships with this use mutation hook, which is a React hook for um, firing off a mutation. In the first two examples of validation, that error uh, boolean that is returned from use mutation, that's going to be false if your validation fails for whatever reason. Don't ask me why. Also, on error is not going to be called. It's going to basically go, go into your on success callback every time 
uh, even if you're uh, throwing errors or returned errors in your GraphQL code, if you're using uh, throwing exceptions, your, your uh, request is still gonna return a 200, but you're gonna actually get an error boolean back, you're gonna, it's gonna call that on error callback. So you've got a lot more, a um, lot easier separation of concerns, um, and you, know, you can do nicer things like this. I'm so glad I, I recorded this one because um, we're not doing any more live demos because that was a train wreck. Um, so we've got validation to say, hey, you're only allowed to create 100 collections. Um, if someone goes to try and create another one, no, nope, sorry, you can't do that. We can display a nice error message. We can get rid of the modal, um, that sort of thing. That's just one thing you can do with validation. So update, I'm gonna smash through this. Again, we've got, uh, this is for toggling that shareability of a, of a collection. Again, you define your schema. Uh, you write your data producer, in this case we're doing validation again, we're just setting a property on the entity and we're saving it and returning it again. Um, and then you add your field resolver, which is very similar to before. And finally, delete. Uh, yeah, basically the same thing, right? You get your schema, your, your field resolvers, and your, your stuff in your, um, your data producer. So I trust you've got it by now. All right. And then we could probably do a super quick little demo um, of the whole thing. So we, we didn't actually get to showing like, okay, saving a resource to a collection. So uh, in this tab, I'm just logged in as a normal user. So this is the Mentally Healthy Workplaces website. Um, this is my local environment, obviously. Um, as a member of the public, you can go and sign up to um, and create an account on this website. The URL is beta.mentallyhealthyworkplaces.gov.au um, or just search mentally healthy workplaces and it will come up. So you can uh, create an account and then you can start learning. So this whole website's around um, you know, giving resources about mentally healthy workplaces. Uh, we're not gonna cover that right now. Uh, don't have enough time. <laughs> so in this case, I've, got, I've logged in as a user. I've got one collection. Everyone also gets a default saved resources collection. So I'm gonna go over to this collection. I've got two resources here. If I go to this resource, do to do, of course I get a giant error. Um, why wouldn't I? <laughs> um, we've got this nice save button here. So um, when we click that, we get a modal. And this is, these are all React apps, by the way. Um, if I quickly look over here, this is one of the cooler things that I wanted to demo. Please God work. Um, so, this modal itself is a React app, and we want to say, we want to save this piece of content to a new collection. So we're going to create a new collection. We're going to give it a name, nice and meaningful. And then um, I've got the network tab open because I wanted to demo something, which is um, why I think GraphQL is so extremely powerful. And yes, you could do this with other things, but GraphQL makes it very easy. So I'm going to create that collection, and you notice hey, I've got the collection already in that modal, but I've only actually done one request. And the reason we can do that is because GraphQL allows us to return really nicely structured data. So we've got all the data we need for this collection directly in the response from our mutation. We can just take that, that object and put it into our query cache. We don't need to refetch that user's collections because we know this new collection is just going to be in the user's, user's collections. Therefore, we can just add it to our query cache. That's gonna cause React to re-render. And then it's just like we created this new collection. Uh, sorry, that we... It's just like we fetched that you know, new collection from the list. So finally, uh, of the final bit of the demo, I'm gonna say, I don't want that in that collection anymore. I want it in my new one save that, that's gonna do fire off multiple mutations which are, can be executed in series, so you can do more than one mutation at a time. You might have seen those little alerts pop up that um, say we've added or removed things from our collection. Um, again, it's displaying the, the correct status. Mm -mm. And then if I go back to my MyHub page, it's got that new collection here and then we've got the save resource. Um, yay. 
<laughs> and this is the toggle share um, functionality as well. And toggle it on, copy the link, go into a new. Oh, that was the wrong. New tab, a new container. Yep, that one. No, I'm not logged in anymore. Hello? Uh, you can just trust me that works, I guess. <laughs> For some reason, it's not pressing enter. Cool. All right, I think we've run out of time anyway, so that was about it. Um, cool. Any questions? For GraphQL? Yeah, I think, well, like, I, I guess a lot of the automation stuff, like, building all that schema out is, it is very hard to wrap your head around. That's probably the hardest thing, you know, all the data producers, and that's what I really wanted to hopefully um, ease anyone into if, they're, if they've kind of looked at that stuff and thought, crap, that looks confusing as hell. Um, and yeah, just um, show you how powerful all that stuff can be. Like, it's very, very worthwhile. Yeah, I think what, some of that kind of stuff is in the GraphQL Compose module. They've got like automated schema generation and all that kind of stuff. Um, you're obviously not going to have as fine grained control over any of it, but yeah, definitely have a look. Jibram? Yeah, um, I've just, I've got, yeah, all of my stuff is um, fully tested. So we just use functional tests and then just um, path, like the great thing about that um, GraphQL I sort of query interface is you can write all that GraphQL query and then you can just inspect the network tab, right, to see exactly what is actually being sent. And then I use that to put into my functional tests and then I just, do those same requests, just make sure, you know, data's coming back or errors are coming back, um, and that sort, of, that sort of thing, so. Um, and then all of the front-end components, the React and all that stuff, um, you, we obviously, we can use like Mock Service Worker, which is a, a way to mock all of your responses in um, React or Jest, sorry. And then we use that for, for testing the actual front-end components. I definitely wouldn't test the stuff in like JTB or something like that. So TanStack query, or it used to be called React query, but now it's used for, it can be used for anything I think. There's like Vue and Ang um, Angular and stuff like that. So um, that, that example, yeah, I didn't want to get into the React code because obviously there was a shitload of stuff, to get, sorry, uh, a lot of stuff to get through. <laughs> but React query is like a way of, as a library to query for stuff and it comes with a lot of like, query caching, um, stale cache, optimizations, retries, all that sort of thing for free, and it's really easy to use. So I'd, yeah, one of the best uh, libraries out there for, for front-end tooling. 